I, I think the common reaction is to look at the valuation and say, this is a very mature company. Why isn't it public yet? Um, but on the other hand, I feel like it's still a very young company in terms of uh, the vision and mm -hmm. how far the amount of progress we've made. There's still a lot more to do. Welcome to the Nuco Shift Dialogues, where we speak with leaders in business, government, and media, the people on the front lines of the greatest shift in business since the Industrial Revolution. Nathan Blischarsik is the founding CTO of Airbnb one of the most celebrated startups of the past decade. But Airbnb is more than just another hot tech company. The home sharing service is reshaping not only the multi-trillion dollar hospitality industry, but also the very concept of trust in a post-Facebook era. Welcome, Nathan. Thanks for having me, John. Thanks for coming. Um, I want to, I like to start with uh, kind of founding mythologies. Um, and I know this story has been told in and you've told it many times, but tell us how did Airbnb come about? So before there ever was a company, Joe, Brian, and I were roommates living together in San Francisco. And then one month, uh, the rent on our apartment was raised 25%. And I said, that's too expensive. I'm out of here. Right, so you were going to leave? Yeah, I, I decided I'm, I'm moving out. Wow. The other two guys, though, they wanted to stay but they had just quit their jobs to become entrepreneurs, also known as unemployed. Right. <laughs> so they actually didn't have the money to stay either, uh, but they wanted to remain. Both of them are designers by background, and they saw that an international design conference was coming to San Francisco. And they also saw that all the hotels in town were sold out. So they got this idea, why not rent out that extra bedroom to designers who need a place to stay for the conference? Right. Now this room, it had no, had no bed because I had moved out. Uh, but Joe set up an air bed, and so instead of calling it a bed and breakfast, he called it an air bed and breakfast. That's where the name Airbnb comes from. Right. They ended up hosting three designers, making $1,000, uh, and all going to the conference get together and having a really great time and experience. And so it was out of that one weekend effective experiment to help pay the rent that the idea of, of Airbnb was born. The story happened in October 2007, and we started the company in January 2008. When did you know that this thing was going to take off? Like you said, January of 2008 was when you started. When did you get the feedback that made you think we might be onto something? It probably wasn't until March of 2009. In fact, the entire first year was extremely difficult. And by the end of the first year, we had not raised money. We were not growing. We had been without jobs. And we had a conversation that, is it time to quit? It's been a whole year. And we made a commitment to each other that would give it three more months that we enjoyed Wine Combinator, be completely focused on Airbnb. And if at the end of three months, it wasn't in a materially better place, we could quit. But it was during those three months during Wine Combinator that things turned around. Mm -hmm. And they turned around because I got some really important advice uh, from Paul Graham, who mm -hmm. said, it's OK to do things that don't scale. Despite being an internet business, when you're trying to develop your value proposition, it's OK to do things that don't scale. And, and for us, that meant going to New York and meeting every single user. And we started by offering them free professional photography. We actually called them and said, would you like a professional to take some pictures? And they were surprised, but said, OK. They'd get a knock on the door. It would end up being Joe and Brian. Uh, they were themselves the professionals, uh -huh. which was a bit surprising. And they, uh, they took the pictures. They did a tutorial on how to use the website, invited them out for beers, told them the founding story, kind of built a relationship with right. these early customers and turned them into evangelists. Um, you know, we believe that it's better to have uh, 100 users that love you than 1,000 users that like you. So we really focused on a set of evangelists in New York. And from there, uh, things really started to take off. So how many people use the platform or have used the platform? Or how many hosts do you have? We have more than 2.5 million properties uh, in 192 countries, 34,000 different cities. And on our busiest nights, we have more than a million guests. Uh, using the, the, the service on a single night. On a single night, a million people sleeping. That's right, and, and other people's homes. In other people's which homes. Which was a concept eight years ago people thought was just totally foreign and, and would never take off at scale. Yeah, uh, that kind of scale is daunting for anybody, but for three founders eight years later who are still very active in the business, how have you managed that transition from a, you know, a startup that, where you almost stopped a year in to now uh, a multi-billion dollar company. Um, how's that transition been? 
Well, I have kind of two answers. On the one hand, time has gone by really fast. Um, it's amazing what we've accomplished, and in some ways, a lot of things haven't changed. We've been very kind of heads down, focused in the details, and that's still true today. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, at our scale, uh, we're just a much bigger team, um, and, and you hire executives, and you're able to delegate. And right. when you do that, it's really important that you communicate a clear vision for where you're going as a team, as a company, um, and that you set up uh, people with the context they need to make decisions. There was a time in the late 80s and through the late 90s when companies, when they got to a certain scale, the venture capitalists would bring in kind of adult supervision. Did that ever cross your minds that maybe you guys were, you know, you needed Eric Schmidt to come in, you know, you needed Meg Whitman to come in, you needed someone who could manage this thing, or was it always, no, the three of us can run this? Uh, yeah, our involvement has never really been a question for us or from our investors. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've always had a really big vision, uh, and so we've always uh, had a clear idea of what more we want to do right. uh, and the path we're on to do that. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, though, with scale, you do need expertise, right. and uh, we've benefited greatly by hiring experienced executives to help run different aspects of the business. So that's been super important to scaling. However, it hasn't been a replacement for Joe, Brian, and I leading the vision of the company. Yeah. So can you uh, state as if you're telling a first-time hire, what is the vision or the mission or the purpose of the company? Right. We want to make it possible for anyone to be able to belong anywhere. We believe um, that when you travel, you should be able to connect with your surroundings, and that has the potential to transform you, transform the way you think about the world. And so the way we deliver that today is through people's homes and connecting them also with hosts who can share their neighborhood, share their favorite uh, cafe, restaurants, activities, um, and put them in a new environment. Right. You know, instead of putting them in a cookie cutter environment yeah. uh, that's been sanitized of the local culture. Well, in a city like San Francisco or a city like New York where housing is at a premium, um, uh, affordable housing is a big, big issue even before Airbnb came on the scene. But now they, they claim, they make the argument, that uh, all this housing stock is being used for out-of-towners to stay in, and it's not available for people to, to live in. Um, what's your response to that? I think on the contrary, uh, I, our point of view is that we actually make it more affordable uh, to own a house, uh, which is that uh, to the extent that you are away traveling or you have an extra bedroom, you can now derive a source of, of income and mm -hmm. help pay your, your mortgage, right. um, property taxes, et cetera. And we see so many of our users benefiting from that. The vast majority of our users are below the median income, and they tell us that they rely on this income to pay for, uh, pay for their housing uh, or other critical expenses. Mm -hmm. Now, it's hard to get a straight story around this topic in general because right. uh, there's so many competing factors. Right. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think, fat, um, Stories being seeded by opponents, the hotel industry, for example, right. um, trying to put forth a different point of view. Yeah. Uh, and it's hard to get really good data uh, because this is something still new. I've stayed in a lot of Airbnbs, and at Nuco, people sometimes say that our festival model, which is part of our business, is like Airbnb applied to events because you don't go into one hotel ballroom, you go out into the homes of entrepreneurs, right? And so you get to see inside them. So we tend to be biased towards that approach. On the other hand, when I've stayed in places like Barcelona, Amsterdam, um, Austin, when uh, the owner drops the keys with me, which I always like meeting them, it's cool to you know, meet the person whose place you're staying in, um, they say, hey, you know, when you, if there's a doorman particularly, don't talk about Airbnb when you're walking by the doorman. You know, it's like the kind of tacit rules because the neighbors don't want to hear it. They don't want to know about it. There's sort of a living in the gray that seems to happen. Is that an example of the shift of societal norms and over time you think that that's going to change or is, is something else going on that I'm missing? Yeah, I think this is the challenge with new things, which is new things aren't accepted by everyone at the same speed. Right. Um, and so uh, hosts are not often comfortable talking about what they do with their neighbors or with their landlord or with the city because they don't know how it's going to be received. It's right. not necessarily a safe space to talk about those things. It's right. too new. Uh, and so this is the challenge. On the other hand, having this activity happen on a platform like Airbnb, I think, um, is a huge step forward in bringing this kind of activity 
out from what would otherwise be uh, completely unregulated space. Right. Uh, and it makes possible uh, things like tax collection, which we've now partnered with uh, 200 different uh, municipalities to collect and remit on behalf of our hosts to cities in a streamlined way. Right. This is something that wasn't possible before, and we're hoping to extend to many other places, too. The early days, I would say that Airbnb, Uber, Facebook are all of a um, almost like a graduating class, sort of 05 to 010 startups, you know? Um, and they all and really a big shift in what happened in the world because of that group. Um, but the motto of those companies was move fast and break things, that's Facebook, or um, ask not for permission, but for forgiveness, mm -hmm. Uber. <laughs> You have a different tack. It feels like the company is different. You know, the, the move fast and break things has been now changed to move fast with stable infrastructure. <laughs> Not as catchy. Um, but I think it's the sign of Facebook growing up. And I think Uber's still deciding whether or not they want to ask for forgiveness or permission. But it seems, strikes me that you're more engaged than the typical kind of Silicon Valley startup that ignores or routes around regulation as damage. Well, we're a hospitality company, and uh, so I think that has a big impact on, on, on kind of how we conduct ourselves. Yeah. I think also, you know, part of our design ethos where we really try to understand different perspectives yeah. means that, you know, we want to hear what other people think. We want to engage, and as entrepreneurs, uh, we see that as a, a challenge and an opportunity, right. um, not something to be avoided. Yeah. China is, is a very tough market to crack, so I'm curious your point of view on the news that Uber after really almost doing everything right, have, hiring native executives to run Uber, working with the government and with regulatory framework there, finally said, some would say, sort of cried uncle and said, okay, we'll take 20% of the market through Didi and, and move on. Um, how are things going in China for Airbnb? Really well. So over the last 12 months, uh, the business has grown 5.6x year over year. Uh, specifically, the number of travelers um, using Air, the number of Chinese travelers using Airbnb to go abroad has increased mm -hmm. 5.6x year over year. That's the segment we've been focused on, Chinese going abroad, and for a very strategic reason, which is it plays to our strength. Uh, despite the existence of local competitors, none of them are able to offer uh, over 2 million homes in 191 other countries. So were those travelers, once they have a good experience outside of China, come back and sort of that instills That's the exactly Airbnb right. ethos into the right. market. So we're offering something in China that only we're in a position to offer because it's leveraging our network effects outside the country. Right. Um, and that's our, our introduction to the consumer, uh, and that's where our reputation's spreading. But then people have a great experience, and they come back, uh, and they'll use us for their next trip, uh, regardless of where that might be. And, right. and that's really the playbook we've used in other countries, too. Mm -hmm. uh, take advantage of the fact that travel is inherently cross-border. Right. This is very different than most other businesses, including Uber, right. which is a marketplace, but on a city level. Yeah. It's not cross-border network effects. Right. Right. But the core issue is trust, mm -hmm. right? And you and Joe and others have had a lot to say about this issue of designing for trust. Can you unpack that a little bit? Well, this is what makes the whole thing work, because the first question people ask is, if I'm going to open up my home, is how can I trust the other person? Uh, and you know, it, it's easy to realize that we don't con directly control either the guest or the host. Um, but what we do do is provide the process, the incentives, to make people behave in the desirable way. But when you go to an Airbnb, you might see the guy, you know, whoever's the host, there's their shampoo in the, in the shower rack. It's a, it's a very different approach. Do you feel like there's a, a positive, broadly, to the idea of, of, of a deeper, more sort of almost tangible connection between people? Well, we, we believe that people are, by and large, fundamentally good, that the vast majority of people are, are fantastic, uh, and that there's just a few people out there uh, that might create that concern mm -hmm. that so many people have. Right. Um, and the question is, can we design a system uh, such that the majority of people don't have to worry Right. Uh, and we can control around the edges uh, right. for anything that's concerning. And you know, hotels actually deal with all the same challenges. They do. Uh, they Lots operate, of people die in hotels. They operate at <laughs> tremendous scale, and everything as, that you can imagine happens as a result uh, because of that scale. Uh, the way they work around that is by developing a brand. 
based, and the brand stands usually for quality mm -hmm. of some sort. And so you trust that they take care of these matters uh, in a way that they're, that just like in the real world, they don't happen often. Um, our version of that is to make sure that the Airbnb brand uh, stands for having the right processes in place, the mm -hmm. right incentives in place, uh, to likewise make sure that the vast majority of our experiences are, are positive. Um, can you see in 10 or 20 years Airbnb being involved in other very large scale businesses that have nothing to do with hospitality? Well, I think travel itself is such a big space. Uh, Multi-trillion dollar market. That's right, yes. Yeah. Multi-trillion dollar market. So there's plenty left for us to do in travel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd say uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, that will be the confines of, of, of where we, we innovate. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, we, we've spoken uh, at a high level many times now about our desire to move beyond just accommodation mm -hmm. uh, and to provide other aspects of the trip. Uh, so I think they're, I think it's still relatively early days in terms of what Airbnb offers um, as a service and as a value proposition. I think that will continue to evolve, but it will still be within the, the confines of, of travel. Yeah. We're sitting in the NASDAQ space, so I feel like I need to ask a, a NASDAQ-related question. And I'm sure what they're asking is, why the heck haven't you gone public yet? I think the common reaction is to look at the valuation and say, this is a very mature company. Why isn't it public yet? Um, but on the other hand, I feel like it's still a very young company in terms of uh, the vision and how far the amount of progress we've made. There's still a lot more to do. Right. Um, and so I think we want to, one, optimize for staying focused on implementing that, that vision, that mission, mm -hmm. um, and to not get overly fixated on managing the business quarter to quarter. Mm -hmm. um, by public expectations. Right. Um, also, uh, you know, IPO is really a means, uh, and it's a means to raise money. And the company is well capitalized as it is, uh, and so we haven't needed to go public in order to raise additional capital. Right. So that's also a big part. Right. Uh, the little Nasdaq bug would would ask me if, however, that might be something that would be considered in the next short term? Year, two years, three years? I don't have any time horizon for you. Yeah. I, I will say- I it, wouldn't it, expect it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I had to ask. You had to ask. The Nuco Shift Dialogues are produced in partnership with the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, connecting entrepreneurs from all walks of life.